talking about uh, system load. So kind of like we've already already discussed, you know, things contributing to the load are going to be, you know, obviously the evaporator's got the heaviest load on the system. The compressor is going to be the second highest load. Anybody any, have any idea on how many BTUs a compressor contributes? You can do the math though, because it's uh, it's using how many volts, you know, how many amps, is, uh, the watts it's using. Mm -hmm. That's three point four one four, and that's the amount of heat. So the condenser has to be sized enough to reject all the additional heat in the system, not just the evaporator heat. So a, say we've got a compressor that runs at 20 amps at 460 volts, how many BTUs are we adding? 460 volts, you multiply that by the 20 amps, that gives you what? So 9.2K? 9200, that's your watts. So we have 9200 watts, so 9200 times 3.41 watts conversion gives you how many BTUs? So 31,000 31, BTUs, end of the day, right? 31,000 of our, so that's basically that compressor right here just contributed um, two and a half tons of our total cooling capacity. So that is the wrap, that is the wrap I have had the heat from the motor. Yes, is that a perfect value? No, some heat will be rejected via the, 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 the housing. Right, so the, the compressor, you know, is, is going to reject some heat through the ambient air. So there you give or take some, but just for the sake of representation, majority of this heat, majority of, so let's say half a ton, out of the two and a half tons, let's say half a ton gets rejected via the body and elsewhere. That still leaves two tons, and this is pretty common on a lot of equipment. Two tons of cooling has to be factored into the condenser as additional cooling required on top of what the, the evaporator capacity is. So if the evaporator is doing 20 tons of cooling, that condenser has got to do 22. Now granted, the, the discharge line between the condenser, the compressor discharge to the start of the condenser coil, you're going to reject some heat through there just because it's such a high differential, but as you're talking extremely minute amount, I mean it's really not that much. Almost all of that heat, you know, 99, 98% of it is going to be rejected there inside of that coil or that heat exchanger, whether it's a tube and tube, barrel, you know, whatever type of heat exchanger you have. That's the kind of heat loads the compressor is, is having to, to I mean, the condenser is having to deal with. So this, again, those are just things to, to think about. Does that really have a whole lot of anything to our daily stuff? Not really. It's just something good to know about. But we start talking load, it's something to be aware of, right? That's part of the reason why we've got to make sure that we provide enough cooling. We've got to have enough superheat left over to handle, in this, in this exact case, two tons worth of cooling. Otherwise, the compressor starts overheating for two and a half tons worth of cooling. So we've got to have roughly two and a half tons worth of superheat left on that suction line to maintain that compressor. Once it's all said and done, you know, discharge superheat is usually much higher. So discharge superheat is, is not proportional to suction superheat. Now that doesn't mean a whole lot, but it does play a factor. If you, you can help diagnose a compressor, I'm kind of getting off on a tangent here, but you can help diagnose a compressor based off of discharge superheat. So if you got a discharge superheat, it's running 60, 80 degrees, even though your suction superheat was 12, Chances are that that compressor is starting to have problems. It may not live much longer. But if it's only do, if you got a 12 degree suction superheat, and you're doing about you know 20, 30 something, maybe probably 30 something degrees of discharge superheat, it's probably doing fine, and that would be considered normal. All that additional superheat is that extra two tons added to it from the motor. That doesn't factor in heat of compression, right? That doesn't factor in friction. That in fact are in several other things. Those are additional heats that the compressor is generating that we can't calculate. Or we pro if you were a mechanical engineer, you probably could. We, we everyday techs, can't calculate that. We can calculate what the motor's doing. That's just basic Ohm's law. Talking about load on the system though, what would we consider a high load? 
What, what's our threshold? When do we start talking high loads? 76 plus, I would consider a high load. Usually most systems are going to be set to where their optimum temperature is going to be between 72 to 75. That is optimum. Now if you start looking at ASHRAE standards, now according to ASHRAE, they rate a system and its sear and efficiency and everything at what load condition? An 80 degree return at 50% humidity with a 95 degree outdoor is ASHRAE standards for um, efficiency of the system. That's what, that's the, when they put it in a lab and say, okay, how efficient is it? What's its sear value going to be? Those are the parameters that they use to obtain that. Now, in reality, real life everyday use, you'll see the most out of the system, in my opinion, for what we, because nobody's going to want an 80 degree return. You'll see the most of what we tune it to between 72 and 75. The vast majority of thermostats are going to be in that range. And again, the system, what, you're, what you calibrate, superheat, subcool, all of that being adjusted to is going to be inside of that range. When you start getting outside of that range, so you say you go 70 or below, or say you start hitting 76, 78, 80, those readings now start to become the extremes of each other, one way or the other, depending on which way you go, because the load is getting outside of the commissioned values. So every time you charge a system or whatever you're doing, you have a target temperature range that you're shooting as a commissioning value, right? That's that 72 to 75 is whether you thought it of thought of it in that way or not. That's typically what guys are trying to achieve. You want to achieve those temperatures to make those people satisfied. So we set the system and make adjustments to try to meet those parameters. That's why, you know, at 80 degrees, we're going to see uh, a really high suction saturation. We're going to see a high superheat. We're going to see a high subcool. We're going to see everything's going to be high. The flip side of that, at 68 degrees, everything's going to be low. We're going to be struggling to generate enough superheat. And if you calibrate that system to run at its peak status at 68, but they're going to keep it at 73, it's, going to, it's not going to perform as well. It's not, it's not going to do what you want it to do. They may not be as comfortable as they want to be because what you tuned it into and calibrated it to is lower than what they want. So now again, your, your, your commission parameters change. Anything above 76, I start to look at and say, okay, you've got a pretty high load. You've got a, a, you've got a substantial load. 75 is that top end where I'm like, okay, well, it's not that uncommon to run into some buildings to run a 75 return, especially in a large open space, warehouse, whatever. Um, you know, it may be 70 degrees down at the, the bottom of it, but the top where all the returns are pulling from, 75, right? That's not unreasonable. And then anything below 70, specifically, I would consider a low load. In some cases, like the McQuay self-contains or even the train self-contains, they don't really perform all that well until that return gets up to about 72 or above. And one of the ways you can help determine their load is by how fast the fan's spinning. So a lot of your building type systems that are running an entire floor that have a VAV or fan powered network on the ductwork, one of the greatest indicators of system load isn't even the return. It's what, what, what is the supply running at? If it has a VFD, what speed is it running at? If it's running at 30 hertz, you ain't got much load. By the time you start hitting 48, 50 plus hertz, now you've got some legitimate load on the system. Doesn't matter if the return is 72 or 75. It's, we do still run into some systems that are vein, inlet, inlet guide vein controlled fans. And so, um, you know, again, at that point you're looking at a proportional reading, you know, it's not a hertz factor or percentage, it's how open are they. If they're running, you know, 20, 30% open, again, they're just, they're, that's very little load. If you start seeing 70% open, you shouldn't see 100% ever. You never want to see that. If you got a, if, you, if you're moving that fan at 100%, something's probably wrong. That or you've got a really high load, you know, that unit, I mean, you'll see that at, if the floor is hot, 
after it's been shut down for too long, you might see that, but you should not maintain that. All that ties back into the load of the system. So load is specifically determined by how much heat we're adding to the system. How much heat are we inputting? We, the, the more air we move, the more heat being inputted, the, more, the higher the temperature of that air, again, the more heat being there to, to pull. Also, the higher the humidity, the more heat there to grab. So those, those are the three major things that we're looking at on an evaporator. We're looking at the amount of air being moved, which for an RTU is constant, how much, how much, what temperature is the return at, and then we're looking, we have to also factor in, which we rarely do, the humidity of that load. So we have a really humid space. It may be 72, 70 degree return, but shoot, we got 65 degrees or percent humidity on the, on the relative humidity coming in, or 70%. That, that's, that's a substantial latent load on that coil that's gonna add a lot of BTUs. Every drop of water in this air contains energy, contains heat, it contains BTUs. And every single time we turn that drop of, of water into, or that drop of, of gas into moisture and water condensation, that, that's a significant amount of, of energy that was just transferred. So you walk in, you see the drain lines just constantly trickling and running. You know, that's an indicator there's a lot of humidity being pulled. There's a lot of latent load on that coil. Just because it's 70 degrees coming in doesn't mean that coil doesn't have a lot of load on it. Because it may be 70 degrees coming in and it may be, say, 45% on the fan, which, you know, is pretty standard, but yet your condenser is still running fairly high. Right? Your condenser saturations are higher than normal. Your building uh, water temp is higher than normal. Well, maybe because it's 85% humidity outside and the building's struggling to stay below 60%. Those are all factors we have to take into account. You know, and you, you don't have to pull a psychrometer out every time. All of our buildings, it's, it's a mechanical requirement that we pull outside air. Extremely few systems that have outside air process that air. You, when you're going to a job site, it's not, it, it's not a bad idea to look at the weather map for the day and say, oh, what's, my, what's our relative humidity for the air today? Oh, shoot, we're sitting at about 75, you know, 80% humidity today. Mm -hmm. You can expect on days like that that you're going to see higher loads. Even though the, the, the temperature may not look higher, the load is higher because of the humidity. You know, it makes, at that point, you... When you start seeing, okay, I've got a, I've got a low return, but I've got a really high condenser subcool and, and saturation. Okay, and you've got again, you've got a 70% return humidity. Makes sense. I, I don't care that it's you know 70 degrees. We can control the load on the coil by the fan. We stage compressors, right? So depending on that, you know. We, that's where our saturations play a heavy factor because depending on what the load is, if you're having a, a high humidity issue, you've got to run a lower saturation. If you're having a, uh, a low humidity issue, you can't have the opposite. You know, we need to adjust things to run higher uh, uh, saturations. They counteract each other. If you're struggling with not enough humidity in the space, Find ways of increasing the saturation on the, on the equipment, right? And if it's the vice versa, not enough humidity, you got to lower that saturation down. Whether you do it by reducing the total volume of air being moved, or what, whether you do it through the metering devices, through the staging of the compressors, however the heck you do it, you know, it, it's, that's how we can accomplish that. So in many cases, RTUs, we can try to slow the fans down. You slow the fan down, you move less air, it allows the coil a better chance to pull more of that latent heat. Versus if the air is moving a lot faster, there's a lot more volume of air, it's going to pull more of the sensible heat and there's, there's not gonna be as much condensation dripping off of that coil. Humidity control, this is where it can get really complicated. There's a lot of systems out there, especially IT server, data room type equipment, that does a lot to control humidity. Uh, we can do that through a number of ways. They may have a um, hot water coil. They may have a hot gas coil. 
you know, about uh, reheat coils is what they'll be called on the equipment. If it's got any kind of a reheat coil, it's probably got some sort of humidity control ability. Uh, at the end of the day, if the system is trying to control humidity, it's doing so by trying to introduce more neutral air, meaning that instead of putting in 55 degree air into the space, it may put that air back in at 70 degrees, but it took the humidity of that air from 60% to 50%. When you start to see those types of things, you will see a system that has, you know, it'll have two coils. One of the coils will have a valve that redirects, like say, the hot gas off the discharge. And it'll send the discharge gas and it'll, before it hits the condenser, it'll first go through this reheat coil. And the reheat coil will, will take a lot of that heat and compensate that heat for the heat being pulled into the evaporator. So inevitably what the evaporator is doing at that point is you end up with a, with a basically a net zero sensible reduction, but you reduce your latent heat significantly. And you're able to run that system for a longer time frame without overcooling the space, but getting the humidity out. Be aware of reheat systems, be aware of reheat coils, be aware of different valves in a system where you know it may look like a funky heat pump. It may not actually be a heat pump at all. It might be a system that has reheat capability. Um, Aeons are notorious. Lieberts are notorious for having both of these functions. They will have hot gas capabilities. Um, that way they will be, you'll have a, a hot gas valve that'll be pushing re discharge refrigerant into a reheat coil and you'll be putting out 70 degree air and it'll just be a lot less humidity. That's very, very common to run into. The unit will be in a dehumidification mode at that point. So you've got a lab or somewhere that generates a lot of indoor humidity internally, right? Uh, there are labs here that we service that, you know, they create on their own a lot of humidity. Yeah, the the P-Test labs are a prime example. If you go inside of those labs, there is a lot of humidity due to the test environment that is being generated. When that humidity gets up to a certain level, we can, if the outside air is low enough, say we got a 40% humidity day, we can utilize that outside air to dehumidify that space. It goes right back into psychrometrics. So then you start talking about outside air systems, economizer systems, and we go into a whole other range of conversations at that point, but we've technically already talked about in the previous class.